About 75 men from the 2nd Massachusetts Infantry entered Shepherdstown on the night of November 24, 1862. They surrounded the house on Duke Street owned by Julia Burke. They were looking for Jeb Stewart's Confederate scouts and bushwhackers. The Federals fired twice at and killed a man running away who was the leader of the group of scouts, Redmond Burke. Then they took prisoner the group of men inside the house. The following day, the Federals decided to go back into Shepherdstown and search homes, take prisoners, and parole rebels, much to the consternation of the affected Shepherdstown residents. At Sharpsburg, there was great rejoicing when it was announced that the next morning that Burke had been killed, especially among the refugees from Virginia who were gathered there. That afternoon, Henry Scott decided he would like to go back to Shepherdstown and uh, check out some of the houses, and especially to see if he could find a horse, a prized thoroughbred, that General Stewart had given Redmond Burke as a present some time before. This time, accompanied by some uh, troopers from the 12th Pennsylvania Cavalry, this approximately the same number of men from the 2nd Massachusetts again crossed at Boatler's Ford. Uh, they described it as very rough crossing the, the river in wintertime. It was, it was uh, very cold, the water was very chilly, or late fall. Tuesday noon, an order came for a similar party to go again to Shepherdstown for the purpose of paroling some rebel officers and men supposed to be secreted in the houses there and to make a further search for papers and arms. This time, I had the good fortune to be detailed for the service and had command of the infantry, the whole party consisting of 75 infantry and about 20 cavalry. Captain Cogswell commanded the whole expedition. We forded the Potomac just below our camp. The water was terribly cold and between two and three feet deep. The bottom was rough and the stream fast. The river here is about 300 yards wide. You may be sure there was very little fun fording it. We kept quietly along the Virginia side of the river for a mile and then made a quick turn up the bank and came suddenly on Shepherdstown The cavalry dashed into the town first and gave chase to a few scouts that were there, but the latter escaped. And um, as they came into Shepherdstown, they noticed a young girl waving a large Union flag and some of them said, well, we have friends in this town. But what the girl was doing was warning other Southerners that the Union Army was, uh, was approaching the town and it was time to take off. When we came up, the people, men, women and children were all on the streets. They seemed to be in a state of great alarm. We made a rapid search through the principal houses and public buildings, finding quite a number of papers and taking and paroling three commissioned officers and 20 privates. Among the arms that were taken was one very good English double-barrel gun, which I have kept and shall try to have some sport with, as quail are very numerous in this vicinity, and I have made friends with the owner of a very nice setter. We recrossed the river safely, and the men were allowed a good strong whiskey ration to make up for their wedding. They enjoy these expeditions as much as anybody. Cogswell, Scott, and the others soon arrived here. 
they went uh, to a house of Daniel Wrench um, nearby. Wrench was uh, called by some the Confederate postmaster of uh, Shepherdstown. They arrested him. They arrested another local man. After a refreshing sleep, my irrepressible adjutant general awoke to sigh over a conjectural loss of property supposed to have been within easy grasp in the preceding night at Shepherdstown, including, and in his mind dwelt much on this, a superb horse, Burke's own charger, given him by his chief steward. It was estimated to be worth the large sum of $800 and also such minor articles as 13 revolvers, as many carbines and untold guns, all concealed in different houses within the town. From conception to execution was an easy step and so quickly taken that at two in the afternoon, 30 cavalrymen with the adjutant at their head had crossed the river at Blackford's Ford, thrown pickets out on all the roads, surrounded all the suspected houses and hailed Captain Cogswell, who had made his appearance on the scene with 75 infantry from the second. While Burke's house and those adjoining were undergoing a thorough search, the hearts of these youthful and aspiring chieftains expanded with rapacity. Operations thus far had been limited to the poor and meaner houses in the suburbs, while Within the village were the wealth, the business, the aristocracy of Shepherdstown. Such an opportunity must not be lost. It was too good and might never return. The cavalry were formed, sabers drawn, forward ordered, and down the pike they went, scabbards rattling, horses dashing, and the, the dues to pay generally. Shepherdstown was their own. There was no resistance. Rather, was their welcome. One comely young woman, beautiful too, the historian of that glorious hour records, waved the star-spangled banner over the invaders' heads as they sped ostentatiously on. Although the wicked did not flee, men and boys in the way of this unopposed dragonade did and a single horseman disappeared over the crest of a distant hill on the Smithfield Road. And there were captures, too. Old Wrench was seized, not because he had committed any overt act of hostility, but rather because he was the owner of a suspected house near Burke's. A hospital of rebels, wounded on Antietam battlefield, was captured, and six nurses, one hospital steward, two lieutenants and 14 sick men were paroled. The infantry led and the cavalry brought up the rear as the expedition returned. The rebels in that neighborhood expressed no very kind feeling toward the second Massachusetts. They vow vengeance, but our means of defense at the river are such that our men would hail a brush for amusement. Out on the Carnesville Road, they spotted a man on a horse who quickly sped off. Some say it was Frank Burke, some say it was George. But whichever man it was, he had Stuart, or he had the uh, Redmond Burke's prize horse. Now, later on, the rumor went around that Burke had been killed that night, uh, had been really murdered that night by assassination that according to the rumor, Burke and his son Frank rode into the uh, area. They dismounted. Burke went towards the house and all of a sudden he knew he was in a trap. And one of the guides walked up and shot him in the heart at point blank range. Uh, in all my research, I haven't discovered any documentation for this, but I have discovered plenty of documents documentation from Union soldiers there that night that their version of what happened was the true story. But once again, Burke uh, was a legendary figure of the area. You know, he lived uh, uh, until his, his 52nd, uh, close to his 52nd or so birthday. And uh, although he only participated in the 
Civil War for a year and a half, uh, he was almost a legendary figure. To hatred of the war, the loyal Southerner added a hatred of those neighbors who, contributing to its existence, denounced him to the authorities and directed the rebel commissary to his grain bin, his smokehouse, and his barn. Our northern troops, whose homes and property were far removed from the actual theater of military operations, moved on in marches and through campaigns without that bitterness or hatred for his enemy, which is born of cruelty or oppression, and in which home, wife, and child, or all, may have been involved. It was not strange that constant appeals were made to me by loyal citizens of Maryland and Virginia for permission to engage in a foray against their neighbors. On that night, while our men were descending the valley, another man in our hospital was entering the valley, the valley of the shadow of death. From his bedside, I heard the tread of our men. As they were crossing the river, he was crossing the river, the final river. As they landed, he died. They were victorious, trusting God that he was. Yesterday was Thanksgiving Day. The weather was lovely. The air was mild. In sight of the river, almost hearing its ripple, we do hear it at night as we lay awake, and our men hear it as they pace its shore all through the darkness. We had our public services, our old New England singing, our prayers. How many of us kept home in mind all day? How many at home were praying for us? The preacher told them that what was a crime at home was a crime here. What they would be ashamed of in their homes, they should be ashamed of here. What they would not do at home with their good mother's knowledge, they should not do here. What they had been taught of truth at home was truth here. Thanksgiving passed off with us very pleasantly. My wine came all right and was very nice. We had a union dinner of all the officers of the regiment. The dinner was very good indeed. Plenty of nice poultry, plum pudding, champagne, etc. We couldn't help remembering last year's dinner and the great change in officers since then, but there was very little sadness manifested and we had a very pleasant time. My company had a fine dinner, bought for them out of a company fund, 10 turkeys, six geese, and 24 chickens and a barrel of cider. They had besides as much plum pudding as they could eat. Then the men had their quoits and balls, Some tried the speed of their horses. All, I hope, had their good dinner. The turkeys, the geese, the chickens, the plum pudding were many. Our hospital inmates all had such peculiar luxuries as would not injure them. The officers dined together, and as at home, members of family returned to their old hearthstones on Thanksgiving Day. So yesterday there came back to us all the officers in our vicinity who had gone from us to other commands, back to the good old regiment. The regiment whose men have been tried in the furnace of fire and stood by one another like true comrades. Among officers and men were many who had felt the bullet and the multitude more who had them in their garments. Many were not there. It was like the vacant chairs in a household to think of the departed heroes.
in time where they went. Some died soon. Amongst the townspeople, Joseph Chapline became the mayor of Shepherdstown April 1, 1867. He died suddenly September 3, 1870 of a spinal infection at his Shepherdstown home at the age of 38 years, 5 months, and 20 days. Julia Burke's home was burned down in the 1870s. She moved to Grant County, West Virginia, and died there in her 70s. George F. Burke, Julia Burke's son, was discharged from Company F of the Virginia 12th Cavalry for chronic rheumatism January 9, 1863. He became a traveling photographer after the war and is buried in Elmwood Cemetery. On September 10, 1870, Lily Perrin Lee began teaching and would become one of the first teachers at the forerunner of Shepherd College in 1872. She would move to Connecticut and consumed by the loss of her husband in war and the war itself would leave the room if Lincoln's name was uttered at all. A letter from General Jeb Stewart told her to thank Daniel Wrench, the merchant, for making him a cape, possibly the letter that was found on Burke and the basis for the arrest of Wrench, who was charged with providing cloth to the Confederates. Daniel Wrench was arrested on German Street the day following Burke's death. He maintained a dry goods store on the western half of what is today's sweet shop on German Street. He was imprisoned at Fort McHenry. Being a 33rd degree Mason, it is written in the Shepherdstown Register. That helped gain his release. He lived to the age of 98 and died peacefully in Shepherdstown. Dr. Alexander Tinsley was the Confederate physician who cared for wounded on the second floor above today's sweet shop in Shepherdstown during and following the Battle of Antietam. He examined Burke's body. He would marry Lily Lee's sister Mary Dear Parent in January 1863. He returned to Shepherdstown eventually after the war and was active in civic affairs and died in 1911 or 1912. Among Redmond Burke's group, Francis Frank Burke was captured by Federals December 26, 1862 in Clark County, Virginia. He was exchanged, recaptured April 21, 1863, exchanged again and transferred to the 2nd Maryland Battalion Cavalry. After the war, he moved to Waco, Texas and had a family. Matthew Polk Burke deserted April 15, 1863 served as a scout and was captured again January 11, 1864. John Redmond Burke was promoted to captain of Company D, 2nd Maryland Battalion Cavalry, was killed in 1863 and is buried in Elmwood Cemetery. Andrew Leopold would be captured, tried, and executed for murder by a federal military court. Thomas Hipsley left no document trail of his whereabouts after serving as a scout for Jeb Stewart. His name might be an alias because the only Thomas Hipsley listed in the entire 1860 census nationwide is a Thomas Hipsley born in Howard County, Maryland in 1856. John O'Brien enlisted in the 10th Virginia Cavalry. A John O'Brien, aged 30, is listed in the 1860 census in Burke's Mill, Augusta County, Virginia, and was born in Ireland. His whereabouts after the war are not clear. Census records post-war show 27 John O'Briens who were born in Ireland in 1830, like the John O'Brien listed in the 1860 Virginia Census. Jeb Stewart, for whom Burke's group would scout, would be killed at Yellow Tavern in 1864 and become a legend. Dying, he ordered that his silver spurs be given to Lily Perrin Lee in Shepherdstown. Among the Federals who killed Burke and captured his gang, Silas Colgrove's regiment became part of the Union 12th Corps in 1863, and after the war he was appointed to a judgeship in Winchester, Indiana, and was elected president of the Cincinnati, Fort Wayne, and Grand Rapids Railroad. He died in 1907. Of the Harvard men from the 2nd Massachusetts Infantry, Robert Gould Shaw would soon leave the 2nd Massachusetts Infantry and accept the command of the African-American 54th Massachusetts Infantry Regiment 
and be killed with many of them July 18, 1863 at Fort Wagner, South Carolina. He would become a lionized figure, the subject of heroic art, and portrayed in the modern-day award-winning movie Glory. Thomas R. Robeson would be wounded July 3, 1863, the last day of battle at Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. He died July 6th and told the bedside surgeon, Well, I suppose I must go. It is hard for me to die with so many bright prospects before me. I feel the cause has been just and I have tried to know and do my duty. Henry Bruce Scott, born in Indiana, he was studying law and became a member of the staff of his brother-in-law, George H. Gordon. He was transferred to the 4th Regiment, Massachusetts Cavalry, through to the end of the war. Joseph Grafton was killed at Averysboro, North Carolina, May 16, 1865. And William Cogswell left the Army in 1865 as a Brigadier General, worked as a lawyer, served five terms in the U.S. Congress, and died in 1895. In the years following the war, Charles Morse achieved great personal and financial success, first as the General Superintendent of the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe Railroad, and later as the General Manager of the Kansas City Stockyards. He also helped to found the Boston Symphony Orchestra in 1881 and died in 1926. George H. Gordon, who had graduated from West Point, practiced law in Boston after the war, helped to found the Military Historical Society of Massachusetts, and died in Framingham, Massachusetts in 1886. Alonzo Quint served as pastor to several congregational churches and in the New Hampshire legislature before his death in 1896. 